Joe, it strikes me that while we're waiting, while people are just filing in, I can do my diversity rant sort of nice and early. Um, I notice it's still a room almost entirely full of men. I've told you about this before. Um, it's great to see that NDC is getting a better uh, set of diverse speakers, but we need to fix the attendees as well. Uh, I will be talking fairly late on in this talk about the importance of diversity, but it's up to all of us, okay? We have to encourage various underrepresented, it's not just women and men, um, there's diversity in so many ways and we need to be encouraging everyone in our jobs, in our personal lives, and encourage them to come to NDC. Wouldn't you like to see a more diverse NDC? I know I would. Um, good. And it's not like NDC is the only conference that has this issue by any means, um, but we need to keep doing something about it. Okay, I shall actually make a start now. White, a blank page or canvas, the challenge to bring order to the whole through design, composition, balance, tension, light, and harmony. Those are the words that got me into this mess. And they started getting me into this mess oh, 15, 20 years ago, probably, when I first heard them. I thought, that's like software. They were written by Stephen Sondheim, or perhaps James Lapine, for Sunday in the Park with George, which I'll come on to in a minute. But I do want to give a little bit of uh, background to this talk. This is the third time I've given this talk now. Uh, the first time was last Monday. So I gave it in Detroit, then in uh, Sandusky, Ohio. Hi, fellow CodeMash people. Um, and now today. And it, it has already been evolving. It's still a somewhat experimental talk. So please, I would like feedback. You know, yeah, the green, yellow, reds are useful, but please email me. Ideally, after kind of a few days, a week maybe, with any thoughts you've had. Whether it's, that section sucks, you should remove it, or I've been thinking about that part, and these are the ideas I've had. Um, I definitely want this talk to evolve more over time. It's my reflections on how code and art interrelate. Uh, how many of you were at the keynote just now? Excellent. Um, I think it's excellent anyway. It's sort of not quite more of the same. It's, it's a different take on similar ideas, let's say. Um, we're going to look at a few interesting pieces of art and focus particularly on Sunday in the Park with George and those words that I spoke to start with. So, let's start with this. This is a Sunday afternoon on an island on La Grande Jatte by Georges Seurat. He lived in the late 19th century, died tragically young, and this was painted mostly in two years 1884 to 1886, um, in two phases, where in the second phase, he reduced the number of colours that he was using and reduced, in the first phase, I believe he did sort of quite a lot of strokes and it became more dots in the second phase. And then there was a third phase which added this border that you can see just running round that's more coloured dots. And this was an experimental piece. Uh, he referred to the scientific method that he was trying to use because it is pointillist. He had the idea that instead of most artists uh, mixing colours on their palette, he wanted us to mix the colours in our eyes. So at one stage he had a canvas of 16 colours arranged in 4 by 4 and he made himself a rule that he wasn't allowed to mix colours that were not next to each other. So if, if he had two colours that were next to each other, he could mix those to form a new colour and put that on the canvas. If he wanted the mix of two colours that were slightly further away, he had to do some dots of one colour and some dots of another, and then we would mix it. Uh, someone who was at my CodeMash talk 
mentioned afterwards that it uh, made them reflect on Zen and the Art of motorcycle, motorcycle Maintenance. Anyone read Zen and the Art? Yep. Uh, if you haven't, do. It's fantastic. Um, it has this key theme of quality and how quality happens somewhere between the sort of source and the observer, that there's this interesting interplay. And Sora was um, expressing and playing with the same kind of ideas. Next comes Sunday in the Park with George. So this is uh, a musical with music and lyrics by Stephen Sondheim and book, as it's called, so anything that's not in a song by James Lapine. And this was experimental as well. This started in 1984, I think, possibly 1986. Um, and the first 25 performances were off-Broadway at somewhere called Playwright Horizons. Out of interest, how many of you know Sunday in the Park with George? OK, a few. You'll know it has two acts. Turns out, out of those 25 performances at Playwright Horizons, only the last three had the second act. I just... Blows me, blows me away. And one of the famous songs from it, Finishing the Hat, which I'll be singing little bits of later on, um, the first time that Mandy Patankin sang that song, he decided to have all the lyrics with him on stage because it was so, it's so fiddly, basically, that to get it right, because things were changing so quickly, it's not like, right, I'm going to rehearse this for two months and then I'll, I'll go and do it. No, he, he kind of learnt it that morning. And so he still needed the lyrics. And I love this idea of being experimental. As I say, there are two acts. I've learned in the last two times that I've done this talk that if I try to explain the plot of Sunday in the Park with George, uh, that will take far, far too long. So all I'll mention is that it's set in two time periods. One, at the time that Sora was painting the picture, and the main characters are George, Sora, although without an S, which the original painter had, but George Sura and his girlfriend, Dot. And uh, Sura is very into concentration, so he is quite still, unless he's actually doing the painting, at which point it's sort of... Um, but he, he sits and looks for an awful lot of time. A plotter, I guess, from the keynote. Um, whereas Dot... I wouldn't say she's a pantser so much as she, she fiddles. Uh, she finds it very hard to concentrate. And so she, she's modelling for George, and she'll get distracted and start imagining that she's in the follies instead. So there's their relationship and how the differences between them and George's uh, de devotion to his art really hurts their relationship. And before the end of the first act... She leaves him for Louis the Baker. But that's after she's conceived a child with George, who is called Marie. Second act is set 100 years later, so in the 1980s, and there's a character called George and a character called Marie. So Marie in the second act is Dot from the first act's daughter. George is her grandson. So George from the second act is George from the first act's great-grandson. And the two Georges are played by the same actor, and the two um, Marie and Dot are played by the same actor. And there's a lot of this repetition happens. A lot of the musical themes happen the same way in the second act as the first act. Sometimes in a way that surprised even the actors. So uh, Mandy Patankin was at a party with Sondheim, an after-show party, and uh, Sondheim said, you know, sorry, I've got you singing the same thing in, in both halves. He said, what do you mean? Well, finishing the hat is exactly like putting it together. There's one note of difference here. Finishing the hat, putting it together. And I, I hadn't realised I'd been singing this all this time and not noticed. Um, if the name Mandy Potunkin doesn't mean anything to you, by the way, uh, then possibly his most famous line will... Um, Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my father, prepare to die. Um, it's a link between Sunday in the Park and one of my favourite films, The Princess Bride. There's another one later on with Ferris Bueller, I'll mention. So, that is Sunday in the Park with George, an experimental 
musical that explores themes of communication and art and community and relationships between people. All of Sondheim's musicals explore relationships between people and how we screw them up. So where's the code? I want to talk about how code intersects with art on the left, craft, and engineering. And you know, I was listening to Felina's talk and thinking, oh, this engineering stuff, I'm about to talk about engineering. Well, part of the point of this is that not all software is engineering, and there are different ways of looking at things. So I think we're good. So if we're going to talk about these three things, uh, I could do with kind of defining them. And I'm not actually going to define them very uh, specifically, and certainly not definitively. If you've got a different idea of what art is, what craft is, what engineering is, that's fine. I will do the best I can to explain what I understand them to be. And to talk about art, we'll look at another picture. Uh, anyone other than my colleagues know who this is by? Nope, but I can see where you're going. Uh, this is by Juan Miro, uh, a Catalan painter. And this isn't actually a painting, it's an etching um, with a print. And this is hanging in my hallway. And I love it. And do you know why I love it? I was hoping you might be able to tell me, because I don't know. <laughs> and that's one of the aspects of art, I think, in a weird way. What you can't easily tell from the screen is that this sort of rectangle that's got the black ink is slightly embossed in, and it's a slightly different color. You may just about be able to pick that up. And I love the way the, the green and the yellow and the orangey red sort of explode out from that. They violate the boundaries. And I love the soft boundaries of the green and yellow and, and the orange, with the black boundaries that are much harder. I've got another mirror that explores that sort of hard versus soft um, more obviously. But there is something really good about this, really satisfying. And I couldn't really tell you what it is. Now, I could paint a picture or, well, I don't know anything about how etching works. But I could do something a bit like this but it wouldn't be art, because I don't have the experience and the craft behind it and the thought process that is whatever is doing what I like here. Given that I can't even express what I like, how could I possibly do the same thing myself? And when it comes to code, art can be a bit similar. So the best example I've thought of in terms of art, is linked to XML. Uh, how many of you are .NET developers? OK, this is good. So um, my first reaction when I saw the link to XML API was, that's horrible. OK, we've got loads of methods and constructors that take object. Like, that's not good. I want to know, you know what I can pass to something. Just saying, oh, just give me an object. I'll, I'll do whatever's right with it. Sounds awful. It's like, I'm working in a statically typed language for a reason, darn it. And they're using the addition operator between x namespace and string. It's like, you can't add a namespace and a string. To get it. it's, that's an abuse of the operator. And then there are all the implicit and explicit conversions you can do in link to XML. Oh, I'll, I'll just cast this element to a string. An element isn't a string. What are you doing? And then you try actually using it. And it's beautiful. I won't just say, you know, it's pleasant. Or it's beautiful. There is beauty in it. It's novel, and yet it's also exactly what you want it to be. And that idea of novelty is more important, I think, in visual arts and musical arts than it is in computing. Because in computing, novelty can be a positive drag. Um, particularly in user interface design. So there is clearly art in UX, but it is not in making things pretty, and it is not in making things novel. Um, I don't know how many of you were 
around when Winamp was you know, the new hotness, and it seemed that everyone created their own media player, and every media player decided, you know, rectangular windows that you all know how to interact with, now nah, we'll do our own thing, we'll be novel. I used a CRM system uh, in the late 90s that on the box said, you know, completely unique user interface. Like, I don't want a unique in user interface. That means I've got more stuff to learn. User experience can be art, but it's in terms of the interaction between the user and the program and how that can be novel and yet familiar. And that tension is part of the art of it. OK, so from one beautiful picture to one that I drew, um, where is craft in coding? Where's the difference between art and craft? Where's the boundary? So is API design craft or art? I tend to think of craft as the sort of skills that you have to learn in order to implement the art. So some aspects of API design, the, the ideas that you're trying to put across may be art, but organizing it appropriately, making sure you don't violate people's expectations, building on conventions, that's part of the craft. And I view craft as something that you can't just get from a book. So craft is experienced. You can read all the blog posts in the world. You can read all the best books about computing. But unless you practice, you won't improve your, art, your craft. And this is where uh, mentoring and pair programming are particularly valuable, because that's a great way of learning someone else's craft. And the fact that we're talking about craft and we have the idea of craftsperson and you know, journeying so that you learn with someone else resonates with me. And craft doesn't just apply to art. We'll talk about engineering in a minute. But think about the craft as the skills you learn that are still somewhat intangible that you may not be able to say, that is exactly why I'm doing that. It's more, well, I've tried that several times, and that worked. I tried doing that several times, and it fell over in various different ways. Or, this time I'm going to do that for some reason that's fairly hard to explain, but I, it feels right in my heart. And the engineering side. Completely coincidental that uh, I chose a bridge here, and so did Fellini. Or rather, it's probably not coincidental. It's the metaphor that we've all been given so many times. So where the art is almost purely subjective, the engineering side of code feels like it should be more objective. And where we apply craft to API design you know, is craft applied to the art. We still have skills that are closely tied to experience that fall into our engineering. So I think of benchmarking as engineering that certainly requires craft, requires a load of experience. Um, how many of us have written bad benchmarks before? Wow, you must be awesome, folks. Or you just haven't written any benchmarks, or you don't know that the benchmarks you've written are bad. <laughs> One of the three. Um, things like setting up continuous integration and making sure you have a repeatable build, all these things are more engineering discipline that still come with a bunch of craft attached. So I'm not going to explain for most things in the remaining 40 minutes um, which aspects I view as engineering, which are uh, art and which are craft. I will for a few. But I want to come back to Sondheim saying the point of art for this fictionalized Sora is to bring order to the whole through design, composition, uh, balance, tension, tension, light, and harmony. So we'll start with design. 
wow, that's an overloaded word. I'm going to use a couple of um, meanings here. But for the first one, it's by design as opposed to by accident. It's intentionality. And this comes definitely back to Sunday in the Park with George. So George was always very deliberate, thinking about everything he did. But it's Dot who actually expresses this best and expresses some urgency in choices that I love. She sings, I chose and my world was shaken, so what? The choice may have been mistaken, the choosing was not, you have to move on. How many of us have found ourselves paralyzed when coding by indecision? I'm checking that both my colleagues who are here have definitely put their hands up, because I know you have. It's so easy to get trapped, and I find that the case where I most often get paralyzed by indecision is where I can see, and maybe I've written up four different options, and they're all terrible. And you sort of think, maybe there's that fifth option over there that I just haven't thought of yet. So I'll just do nothing and just wait. And of course, it never happens. And sooner or later, you have to choose. You have to move on. Some design decisions can be postponed, but often they can't. And there are some aspects to making decisions that I think aren't always obvious. Let's look. This is, uh, I think there are two slides with code on. This is the first one. The second one's not much more detailed either. So imagine this is a C-sharp method declaration. What choices have we made here? OK, well, the obvious ones, we've made it a void method. It's not going to return anything. We've chosen a name for it. We'll talk more about names later. And we've chosen that it'll be parameterless. Are those the only decisions we've made? Far from it. This is an instance method. It doesn't have the static modifier assuming it's not in an interface. Um, it's not an unsafe method. It may still be able to contain unsafe code if our type is declared as unsafe, but otherwise, that's another decision. It's private, and it's non-virtual. And those last two decisions are really, really interesting ones to me, because imagine we had a lowercase f, so it became Java. What decisions would we have made then? We would have said it's an instance method. Um, OK, there's no unsafe modifier in, in Java. But there are probably a few other ones. You know, it's, not an un, it's an unsynchronized method. Importantly, we still decide whether or not it's virtual, and we still decide the access. But in Java, this would be a package access method. And it would be a virtual method because Java has different defaults. Why is this interesting? Because I see a lot of methods like this. I've worked in Java for quite a while, and I've worked in C-sharp for quite a while. And most of the time, in C-sharp, you don't see people adding the virtual modifier. And most of the time, in Java, you don't see people adding the final modifier. Now, Java and C-sharp are sufficiently close idiomatically that normally, if you were porting a, method, a, a code base from one to the other, you would normally make the methods virtual or not you know, the same way. It doesn't matter whether you're porting from C-sharp to Java or Java to C-sharp. The situations in which you want virtual methods are similar. But the fact that most of the time you don't see a modifier suggests that people are making decisions and not being aware of them. So there are a whole other language um, design decisions to be made around you know, what is reasonable to have defaultable and what should always be stated explicitly. You know, if, we have, if you're declaring a class in both Java and C Sharp, you can, by default, derive from that class. You can make it final or sealed in C Sharp. Sorry, final in Java or sealed in C Sharp, but it's implicitly 
unsealed, unfinal. Is it reasonable to have that as a default, or should we force people to think about things? Um, applying this to API design, some of you may know my node time library for date and time work. I very consciously went away from the common, you know, don't make me think. I can't remember whose book it is, but don't make me think. No. As the node time designer, I force you to make decisions. That's why there are umpteen types in node time where there's just date time and time span and date time offset. You know, there are, there are three time-related types in .NET, basically. We've got about 15 in node time because they represent different things. And darn it, you should know what your data represents which makes it harder to get started, but hopefully means that once you've, you know, the, the design of node time is you think you make the decision, the decision and then it's my job to make that decision easy to implement. But the thought about what decisions are you making and being intentional about those decisions is an important one. I've been interested in date and time stuff for quite a while, but uh, node time is now pretty mature. Um, I'll be doing an update to it today because there's a new set of time zone data when Travis has sorted itself out. Um, any of you waiting for Travis to be sorted again? Yeah. Um, had an outage last night, very annoying. Uh, but I've moved on from being interested in date and time to being interested in versioning. Because I thought being interested in date and time wasn't obscure enough. Um, versioning is more and more important, I think, and really poorly understood. How many people use semantic versioning? OK. Uh, so if I present you two versions of code, you know, right, here's before the commit and then what the commit changes, would you be able to tell me whether that fine to go in a new patch, a new minor version, or a new major version. You know, it's easy, isn't it? If it's non-breaking and just an implementation detail so it doesn't affect the API, then that's a patch. If it uh, is non-breaking but does change the API, then it's a minor version. If it is a breaking change, it's a major version. Dead easy, we can all go home. What's a breaking change? If I have a method that previously would throw an argument null exception if you pass null into it, and then we say, actually, now you can pass null in. How many of you think that should be a new major version? Oh, so that's a non-breaking change. What if I'm writing a method that's going to use that method, and I've said, my parameter, you know, that what you pass into me, that can't be null. And the first thing I do is call into that next method, passing my parameter in as an argument to that method. And that's fine, because that method throws if the argument's null, right? So I don't need to do the checking myself. I'm just going to rely on this throwing if I pass in null. Well, if that doesn't throw anymore, you've broken me. You were all wrong apart from Bill. Uh, no. <laughs> there were a few other hands up. Uh, but you need to work out what rules you want. Maybe you decide that you're going to publish your set of rules. And I started writing a blog post about this last April. And it's not going to be a blog post. It's going to be a whole GitHub site at some point. Because just there are so many things to think about. Versioning is really hard. And it's all about the impact of decisions. If you make a decision to make something public, then that affects what you can do with it later on. And that's just the simple way of understanding things. So it feels like engineering, sorry, it feels like versioning should be an engineering issue. There's engineering there, but there's an awful lot of craft as well in understanding the impacts. Next up, we've made decisions. We understand, or we're trying to understand, what impact those decisions will have in terms of what decisions we can make in the future, how do we communicate them? This is definitely a craft. We cannot document every single decision we make. Okay, imagine, you know, I, I do always put, 
the private modifier on C sharp methods when I want them to be private because it communicates that I've made a decision. And I think that's important to say. But even if there were a modifier saying non static, you know, suppose you could say, I deliberately made this an instance method, and you could say safe. And in Java, you could say unsynchronized. There are so many modifiers that we could have, but it would just be noise. It would be garbage. There's only so much bandwidth that we can have. So the next decision you need to make is which decisions you need to talk about. Where do you put comments on code? You know, every line of code is a decision. Which ones are you going to comment? And just as all decisions, we need to be intentional about this. We need to think. Don't just haphazardly sometimes comment and sometimes not. Think about, if I'm making this decision deliberately, why might I need to revisit it? And what's the future person, whether that's me or someone else, going to need to know in order to be able to reevaluate that decision? So intentionality and making choices is one part of design. The other part of design that I'm going to talk about, there's an awful lot about software design that I'm not mentioning at all. But I want to talk about representation. And this is where I want to briefly describe the very end of Act 1 of Sunday in the Park with George. So as well as the characters I've mentioned, there are loads of other characters. Um, I think my favorite is Louise, who is a young girl um, who's being looked after. So she's the daughter of an artist um, and his wife, and they're sort of being looked after by servants. And she comes and says, let's go and throw stones at the ducks. It's just this wonderful line. Um, and then she, she tattles on uh, her, her dad, who's having an affair, and all kinds of things. But they all come and interact with each other. And in the very last scene of um, Sunday in the Park with George, Act 1, they're all moving around, and George is watching them. And they gradually settle down, and he comes and moves them. Just a touch. And then they all freeze as they sing Sunday and they are in exactly the spot for the painting. And then the painting flies in, and everyone applauds because it's so incredible. But I want to just reflect on the representations going on here. Because you've got actors playing characters, and those characters somehow also being moved by another character in a way that would never happen in real life. You don't just go up and say, right, I'm just going to move you there because that's where you are in the painting. So you've got people representing sort of two things at the same time. It gets weirder at the start of Act 2 where they start off in the same place. So this is just before it goes to 100 years in the future. They're in the same place and they're singing It's Hot Up Here. At that point... They're no longer real characters so much as they are characters in a painting hanging in a gallery somewhere, and they're singing that it's really annoying to be hanging in a gallery. And there are just levels of representation there that I find really intriguing. And it's all about the view that you get. It's intriguing because it's a different way of looking at the world. And I think art is usually about looking at the world in a different way. And that's what we do all the time. So imagine you're trying to represent your beautiful user. How many of you have any kind of product or software that represents a user? Yeah, it's a fairly common thing to model. Do you try to capture everything about the user? Or do you capture the stickman version? that is just some bare essentials. It's whatever your application needs. You're not trying to represent the, rea the reality. You're trying to represent the essentials. I like to use the analogy of a photo. If I took a photo of you now, and it were perfectly in focus, it would be accurate, but not terribly interesting. I wouldn't view it as art. How can a photo be art? 
by the skill and art of the photographer capturing something more interesting than just the accuracy of this is what it looked like at that time. They're trying to capture maybe an interesting juxtaposition. We'll talk about composition in a minute. Some way of representing more than just what is there at the point in time. So in software, we're always making models. We're always trying to represent things differently. And again, um, I want to sing you a couple of lines, this time uh, from Marie rather than from Dot. So this is where Marie, Dot's daughter, is looking at the painting and marvelling. And she sings, The child is so sweet and the girls are so rapturous. Isn't it lovely how artists can capture us? This idea of capturing something of the essence of something. And it can go slightly wrong. Coming back to Noda time, um, what would you think are the essential parts of a date? Okay, if you were having to model a date in software, what would you model? I can stand here all day. Year, month, day. That's a really good start. I will add calendar system. So, you know, January, what is it, the 17th? January 17th, 2018 in the Gregorian calendar system is a different date from January 17th, 2018 in the... Um, I've completely forgotten the name of the word for the calendar that came before Gregorian. Gregorian. Julian, thank you. Wow. Um, Julian calendar system or any of the other calendar systems. But having year, month, day, you know, I was aware to start with that that would exclude some calendar systems that were sort of more week-based. What I didn't realize until a year ago was that even things that are based on year, month, day might not be properly representable by that model. We got a feature request for, to implement the Wondrous or Baha'i calendar system which is each year has 19 months of 19 days, and the fact that there were 19 months meant that I couldn't represent the month as four bits anymore, so that was annoying to start with. Um, I've got it all packed. It's, the optimization side is a whole other talk I might do sometime. <coughs> it's really fun. Um, but it's 19 months of 19 days and four or five other days that aren't in a month. So if you ask someone, you know, what month is it today? Oh, it's not. <laughs> it's in the wondrous days for this year. <laughs> That's really unhelpful. Uh, the wondrous or Baha'i or Badi calendar system. I think if you just search for wondrous calendar, you'll find it. Um, I do find it interesting. If that's used by the Baha'i faith. I don't know whether it's occurred to you uh, that calendar systems are probably the closest... Um, intersection between code and religion. Almost all calendar systems that I've looked at have religious origins. You know, why is the Gregorian calendar system called Gregorian? Because of Pope Gregory. And uh, timestamps, UUID timestamps, are based from one point at which the Gregorian calendar system came online, as it were, took over from the Julian calendar system. Whole other talk, sorry, I mustn't get distracted. So we're trying to capture things, and that's another element of decision. It's sort of a simplification that does try to bring order to the whole, bring this hugely complex and wonderful world that we're in into something more manageable. OK, talked about design. What about composition? In art, or in particular in Sunday afternoon on an island of Le Grand Jat, there are various elements of composition. Three obvious ones to start with. Firstly, at the lowest level, we have a picture that is more compositional than most paintings. It is little dots. And those compose into objects. You know, a person, a hat, a tree, a fishing rod. Then there's the more regular composition of the artist saying, how would it be interesting to have figures in the background or foreground or in the shade or in the light? 
And that's something that you know, artists know all about and do differently. And then there's sort of meta-composition. I mentioned that there was a third phase of painting where Sura added, apparently had to stretch the canvas again to, to get some more space. And then he added this border. <coughs> so there's a border around the work. This is sort of part of the work. And then I believe there's a white frame around it. That is part of the composition. The work includes the whole thing. Just yesterday, I received another Miro print. Um, it's turning out to be quite an expensive hobby, uh, collecting Miros. And I took it to the framers. And it looked beautiful as it was, but it will look more beautiful when framed. That is part of the composition. So what does this mean in software? So the equivalent of dots building into people and hats and things is the composition that happens all the time in code. We build statements from expressions. We build methods from statements, types from methods, assemblies from types, bigger systems or whole applications from types, sorry, from assemblies, and then larger systems from multiple subsystems. The whole aspect of microservices is composition writ large. It is defining how you compose things and working out that making, shoving things too much together doesn't really help. And what I find interesting around, uh, sorry, no, next, next slide, regular composition. Uh, when you think about preferring composition over inheritance, this is the kind of composition we would normally think about. We're building one type from three fields. And one of the things I've been trying to think about is where composition adds value, where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And there are a few aspects to this. One is names. We don't just have a black circle, a green square, and a red triangle. We have them with particular names. If we had two moments in time and we call one a start and one an end, and we put, put them together and called them an, an interval, then we are attaching meaning to each of those values. They are not just item one and item two. If I have more time, I'd go into how tuples in C Sharp have evolved, that we have the tuple of T, T1, T2 type, that just has item one and item two, and C Sharp 7's tuples having names to the elements. Come to mine and Bill's talks later on this afternoon to find out more about that. But it adds so much value in a way that you wouldn't expect, in a way that isn't just engineering. It's not something a computer would necessarily appreciate, but it talks to the human side of coding. Additionally, we have meaning by saying, well, when we've got a start and an end, we can then talk about the duration of this interval. Certain operations only make sense on composed values, not on each individual value. But at a meta level, when we decide to compose and when we decide to make that public, we are providing value by saying that this composition has value. There are various times in our implementation that we might compose things like a user ID and date of birth. That isn't a useful type in itself, even though you may want to project a database table to it so that you can find the oldest user in your table or whatever it is. You wouldn't make that public, again, a decision, because it's not a generally useful thing. When we write our code, we are telling a story. And this time, I'll turn to another favorite Sunday musical, Into the Woods. Children will look to you for which way to turn, to learn what to be. Careful before you say, listen to me, children will listen. Careful the tale you tell, that is the spell. The types that you decide to expose publicly, or even within an assembly, say, this has value, this has some general purpose. This is a useful way of adding things together. Again, the value is more than just 
I've got three things and I'll put them together. It's how you put them together and the fact that you do so. <coughs> Finally, this is an area I know less about, but functional composition. I want to mention both link and async. So link works nicely because it composes, and so does async. I can take a sequence and either project it or filter it, and then that gives me a sequence. It gives me the same kind of thing. It may be a different shape. You know, it may be a sequence of users instead of a sequence of user IDs, but it's still a sequence of something, which means I can go and apply more operations. So you can chain things together. Likewise, tasks. Async await works well because the kind of thing you can consume in an async method, i.e. a task-based type, is the kind of thing that an async method spits out as its output. So you can call one async method from another, from another, from another. And that's why it's so painful when you have to go from async to sync, or vice versa, because you're changing the model. I think this has something to do with monads. <coughs> if I knew more about monads, I could look really clever by explaining it. But instead, because I think it's got something to do with it, I can appreciate some of the value of it. I can sort of say what I like. Does that remind you of anything? It's exactly what I was saying about the Miro earlier on. This is computer science as art, as there's something deep here that I can appreciate without fully understanding. Moving swiftly on. Tension and balance. I've put these two together, partly for the sake of time, but partly because I don't like tension. And this was what I got pulled up on most in Detroit. So tension in art can be good. In Sunday in the Park, those lines that I said at the start, you know, through design, composition, balance, tension, light, and harmony, after each of those words, there is a split chord played. And it's beautiful to listen to. And I didn't know why until I read an interview with Sunday where they showed the score and said, look at all those chords. They're missing their bottom note the natural bottom note that sort of should be there until harmony. So as you listen to, there's something, there's something, there's something missing. What's going on? Harmony. And the tension resolves. Now, I made the statement in Detroit that I didn't like tension, that tension in software was never a good thing, and that balance was sort of the best compromise we could have to resolve it. And there was pushback saying that, Tension is what drives us to be better and that it's a natural and good force. I'm still thinking about it, and I urge you to do so as well. But there is definitely balance to be had in terms of which projects do you work on, which issues do you work on, um, do you write new features or pay down technical debt? You know, none of us have enough hours in the day. Last week at CodeMash, I had the tension to resolve between playing cards against humanity or doing a sing-along Hamilton. It's good things, and you need to get the balance right. This is true in Sunday in the Park with George as well, in terms of work-life balance. <clears throat> George loses himself in his work so much that he can sort of tell that he has lost, that he lives through his painting. And so he sings, finishing the hat. And he sings about the slightly manic, obsessive side of things. He sings, finishing the hat, how you have to finish the hat, how you watch the rest of the world through a window while you finish the hat. How many of us have been in, whether it's a death march or whether it's just a crunch at the end of a project or whatever, where we're living, but we're not really living our lives and sometimes that may be necessary for brief periods, ideally not with good planning, but often we put ourselves to it when we don't need to. Oh, I'll skip dinner 
because I really want to finish this bug. Not that I have to finish this bug, but I want to. And I'd urge us all to examine that work-life balance for ourselves. But the way that finishing the hat ends is what speaks to me most about software. He sings to the audience, look, I made a hat where there never was a hat. He's created something out of nothing. And that's what drives me all the time in computing, that it's just such a joyful experience of there was nothing and now there is something. And I can totally see how that applies in art and knitting. Not sure about running, but you know, it is creating something out of nothing and that is a joyful experience. But let's make sure that we keep our relationships and our lives and some sense of perspective. I wasn't quite sure what to do for light. What does light mean in terms of code? In the part, uh, sorry, in Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte, almost all the characters are in shade to some extent, with the sort of exception of the girl in the middle. Uh, how many of you have watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off? You have seen this painting because it's in the Art Institute in Chicago, and there's a beautiful montage where um, Ferris, Cameron, and Ferris's girlfriend, whose name I've temporarily forgotten, um, go to the Art Institute, and Cameron looks at the middle of the painting and this girl, and they gradually zoom in. And if you want to zoom in for yourself, by the way, the, the painting is in the Google Cultural Institute. If you search for Google Cultural Institute, and then within that, search for Sura, you can zoom in to such a fine detail, all meaning evaporates, which was kind of the point of the bit in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. But you'll also be able to see the light and that that one character, one person who is looking out at the viewer is in light and almost everyone else is in some kind of shade. I think we are moving in computing into the light as open source becomes more and more prevalent and so does transparency. Arguably, with privacy concerns, we are trying to draw a more distinct but nuanced division between light and dark. Which information should be public and which should be private? I'm not going to say that everything should be public. I'm saying it should be a deliberate decision as to what we make public and what really benefits being private, whether that's intellectual property or personal information. I'd also say that, just like with light, if you expose too much data, it doesn't actually give information. Just as if you have a blinding light, you can't see anything. If there is huge amounts of data, then you never know what's going to be hidden there. Always be nervous when a company releases thousands and thousands of pages so you don't know which page of the report you should actually be looking at. The final word that Sondheim uses is harmony. And this is um, copied from, from the score when they're singing Sunday at the end of Act One. And here's where I want to talk about people more. If Tension and balance are about competing concerns. Then harmony is about elements that aren't in competition, but help each other to excel. And here I want to change the analogy somewhat to a choir or an orchestra. <clears throat> if you're singing solo or playing a solo instrument, then you can decide to be as loud as you like. You should use the dynamics in the music but you could play quite loudly. If you're in an orchestra, you have to be listening to other people. And if you're playing too loud, then a good conductor will tell you. Non-judgmentally, constructively, but you'll be called out for playing too loudly. In a really good orchestra, the conductor doesn't need to do it. Well, partly because people are less likely to play for their own satisfaction as for the team doing the right thing, just as in a harmony. But also, we could call each other out 
and say, hey, first violin, you're playing a bit too loud. The second violins can't be heard. Again, without judgment, without implying that they're less of a person. And obviously, this talks to computing teams <clears throat> and trying to hear all the voices in a team in an atmosphere of psychological safety. Because a good team, just like a good orchestra, doesn't play on one note. They don't express one idea. That's really boring. Can you imagine an orchestra all playing just the melody? Imagine how tedious that would be. They're contributing different notes. And again, the sum is greater than just the sum of the parts would be. But they know how to do it well so that they come together appropriately. And so it really has to be in computing. And at the moment, we have an awful lot of brass bands. We have a lot of teams that are made up of people who have had very similar life experiences who look kind of the same and will have very similar ideas. They will play with similar tones at a similar pitch. And they can play some nice tunes. I like brass bands. But I prefer the richness of an orchestra. Just in case it's been too subtle, this is all about diversity in our teams, right? In our whole industry. Didn't want it to go unnoticed. <laughs> But it's not just about our teams, either. It's about listening to the other people around us. Just as there was the surround of the painting helps to make it what it is, so there's the people around our teams. So I work in Google Cloud Platform on making C Sharp rock for GCP developers, or GCP rock for C Sharp developers. So I have the team that I'm in, and I need to listen to my colleagues and make sure that everyone's heard there. But I have customers. And I have other teams that I need to work with. And I have users asking questions on Stack Overflow and all kinds of people. In my day-to-day -day life, I am my own melody, and they are sort of providing the harmony. But my work just provides the harmony for their own melody. Basically, the world is better if we listen to each other. We've spent huge amounts of time so many books have been written about how to do software well in terms of the code. I think as an industry, we need to spend an equal amount of time working out how to pay attention to humans, whether that is our own teams or our users or all of the other people involved. This isn't art or craft or engineering. It's the background to everything. It's the canvas on which we paint our work. So to sum up, we are incredibly lucky to work in an industry that is so much creative and so much engineering. Because there's fun in engineering as well. It kind of sounds boring, engineering. But it's fun to do engineering, and it's fun to be creative. I hope I've convinced you that software is an artistic endeavor that has some grounding in engineering. I hope I've persuaded you that software is far more than just bits on a screen. It's human interactions. I've spoken the first line of the, uh, of the musical, and I want to end with the last line. White, a blank page or canvas, his favorite. So many possibilities. Thank you. <laughs>